All right, so today we're going to dive into the Citibank report and also what their strategy is overall. This is a very important video. I think you guys, if you're maybe into crypto for the first time, or if you're an old dog in crypto and you've been around the block, you're going to get a chance to see this thing that we call use case. And use case is very important because this is really kind of the future of blockchain. So we'll break it all down for you today. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back into Tech Path. All right. Um, Let's get started on this. I want to go over to Citibank's recent news. And, and part of this is tokenizing assets. If you look at what their plan is, this was their that when they dropped the press release. I'll just hit on a few points here. I'm going to zoom in on this for you guys. So tokenizing services for cash management and trade finance using blockchain and smart contract technologies. Cities uh, token services will provide cross-border payments, liquidity, and automate, uh, automated trade finance solutions 24-7. So this is all good news. And it starts to go into some specifics here. So they've had a, cu a couple of successful test pilots. The innovation solution has a promising application for trade finance. So they already see the future here. They're expected to reduce transaction processing times from days to minutes. That to me is an order of magnitude in terms of opportunity for the banking system. I think what we're gonna look at in today's video is to come to the realization that every bank out there is going to make most likely a similar track to what Citibank has done. Further into this release, enabling clients to transfer liquidity between city branches and on a 24-7 basis. This is all just going to make everything faster. The private permission blockchain technology uses owned and managed by city and clients will not be required to host a blockchain node to access the services. So another benefit, because this will be both for institutional and I think eventually for for retail. So this is a pretty cool, interesting aspect. Now, what they did was they published this massive report. Now, I'm not going to go through all 100 pages of it. I'm going to go into specific pages that will break down some of the key things that you need to pay attention to here for this, because there's a handful of projects that are going to benefit in a very big way. So if you're trying to make a play on the future of banking finally getting and integrating into blockchain, there are some things within this report that I think you'll want to see. First of all, I want to hit on page three. This is, I'm going to zoom up on this. This is their money, tokens, and games. Just in case you guys can make some notes, there's a lot in this report, but tokenization expected to grow by a factor of 80x in private markets and reach up to almost 4 trillion in value by 2030. So this is massive. Then you've got this scenario. To be successfully adopted into mainstream, blockchain needs the help of basically three core elements. And what you see here on screen, one is decentralized digital identities. Yes, okay, there's a lot of people doing that, and we are seeing a lot of strides in advancements there. Two is zero-knowledge proofs. Yes, we've got that in play. Three is oracles. Very interesting here because, again, Chainlink, one of the only real Oracle blockchains out there in, in terms of the ability to go to cross chain. And this is something we'll get into in a second. And then number four is secure bridges. Just another scenario that is already started and we've already proven that this can happen. So they've already identified this. Further into it, I'm going to go down to page five. Let's go over to page five. This is where they start breaking down these technology drivers and how it helps the adoption. But the area that I want to focus on is the oracles. This is going to serve as a bridge between blockchain ecosystem and external data sources. So remember, the ability to go into other blockchains, because if Citi is going to do their own blockchain you know, concept here, that means other banks are going to do that as well. So you're going to need that capability to go cross-chain. And that is a big, big deal in the blockchain industry. And of course, will be a huge uh, factor here in what they're trying to do. Now, we go all the way down to page 71 in this report. Let me kind of fly through some pages here. And I want to jump into page 71. And here we go. Now, the reason I want to get into page 71 is because this gets into Avalanche. So we've already shown, shown Chainlink, huge. And we'll show some video clips here in a second to break some of this out. But here's John Wu. We've had him on the show before, and he really gets into their services and what they've been trying to do in terms of tokenization. And the strategy that they've implemented over the last few years has continued to accelerate. And you guys know how much we talk about Avalanche, mainly because I just believe what they're doing is very interesting. And I think the technology a play that they're going after. A couple of things that he actually responded to, this is one of his quotes, more complicated, the asset class, 
the more value tokenization can add in structured products. If you have so many participants trying to figure it out, transparency of the data, all that pricing on data, you get it. The point is tokenization is going to be a huge asset here. So that's another uh, advantage, especially from the case of Avalanche. So if you're looking at, you know, how do I play the potential future of banking, traditional banks going into blockchain and starting to use this in use case scenarios for our actual business with the banks themselves. I want to go over to page 115 now. This was another one that kind of breaks some things out. This was a very, very long report. So if you guys want to spend the hours coming through it, feel free. But here's page 115. This was another one that gets into, yeah, into the Oracle side. So uh, it really starts to drill into one thing. And the Oracle connectivity is so important here. And the reason is, is prominent oracles in select blockchains. Remember, you need that cross compatibility here. And notice that we've got Chainlink identified in Avalanche, BNB, Cardano, Ethereum, Polygon, Solana, and even Terra. So the point is, is that Chainlink is, is in almost every chain, or at least the capability. So no matter what chains are being built out there, I shouldn't say no matter what, but Likelihood is I think a chain will continue their development. But the point is, is that as we see more and more chains start to disperse into the banking system, that Oracle position is going to be huge. And of course, Chainlink is the one that kind of plays into that. I want to go to the first clip here. And this is getting into the first SWIFT test that Chainlink did. Let's go to this clip. So we've been working with Swift uh, for over five years. So this is the second proof of concept we've now done with them. This one is much larger, including the DTCC, Euroclear, and many of the top banks like Citi, BNY Mellon, um, and, and many others. It achieved three very important things. The first thing is that it proved that you can use existing bank infrastructure like Swift and Swift messages to easily connect to hundreds of chains with a very minimal amount of effort from banks which means that banks can go onto hundreds of chains very efficiently. The second thing that it proved is that multiple chains, both public and private, can be connected efficiently and reliably for those banks to transact with each other. And then the final thing that it proved is that those private chains can transact with public chains effectively, meaning that value from the private bank industry can flow into the public blockchain industry, which I think will have a, a very important impact on both the banking world and the public blockchain world. All right, so there were some things that happened during this test. Now, ANZ was one of the in entities that were involved in this. We'll go over their website. This was some of the things that they identified here. So June, the Swift worked more than a dozen financial, major financial institutions and Web3 services platform Chainlink to explore how it could facilitate interoperability between blockchains and existing financial infrastructures. Uh, that's a little bit about what the clip kind of got to, but it also gets into, uh, obviously, ANZ was active participant in SWIFT's work. This all starts to tune into some scenarios that played into this for SWIFT. So building on the lessons learned from Swift, SWIFT initiative, ANZ recently worked with Chainlink CCIP to compete the test trans transaction to simulate the purchase of a tokenized asset facilitated by ADC and ANZ issued the New Zealand dollar denominated stablecoin. So all this happening in, uh, in Australia and New Zealand. And this is where it gets kind of uh, intriguing because now you've got the framework that what uh, Sergey was talking about is that to be able to ride on some of the existing infrastructure, that's an important element that I think is very interesting to consider because this will help you know, the potential adoption become much, much faster, especially with the banking side of it. I want to go over to this next clip where they kind of break down into um, where ANZ and Sergey were talking about how this moves forward. Listen in. The value and the message moving together is revolutionary. It's going from a, a sequential world of messages, then value transfer in domestic markets to one of cross-chain message and asset transfer. And that's, that's a real breakthrough. So big breakthrough there, and I think this is the thing that everybody's looking at. The, the potential opportunity here is, I mean, you just think about the banking industry. You look at the real use case for a lot of these real-world assets. These are the kind of things that many people have often challenged me and asked me, what is the use case? You know, show me some examples. And in many cases, it's very complicated to kind of uh, give you the track. But I think what's happening now is we're starting to see how these major corporations, these major, major institutions 
have started to realize the potential here in terms of a technology infrastructure that can really change speed of finance, which is going to go into a, a lot in the coming years. All right, so let's go to another clip. I want to talk a little bit about these kind of these ideas of siloed blockchains because this is important. This is going to get into a scenario and why Chainlink uh, is so important. Listen in. There was previously a thesis of I will make my own chain and everyone will go on my chain and I don't care about anyone else's chain. That thesis is now gone. Nobody is saying I'm going to make my own chain and I don't care about my counterparties, their chains. I think everyone has now realized that there's going to be huge fragmentation, um, that banks are going to have their own chains. Every bank will have at least one chain. Every bank will probably have their own stable coin. Every bank will probably have hundreds of real world asset tokens that they all generate. And I think this realization leads to the, the next question of, well, if we all have hundreds of, of our own chains, how do we transact with each other? Because our chains are not compatible. All our chains use different technologies. They're on different uh, systems. They, they can't even communicate with each other. And so what I've, what I've seen is, is both an understanding that everyone will have their own chain. I've seen people appreciate the need for connectivity and interoperability. And then I've seen a few banks like ANZ Bank uh, which manages uh, about a trillion dollars in assets that have gone further. So I now see banks not only doing custody, not only having their own chains, not only planning to do stable coins, but actually starting to make real world assets and those real world assets being in demand by their clients. So I would say we're at the beginning of something very, very big here for the capital markets. And I would say that getting them connected to each other will accelerate that. And then getting them connected to the public blockchain world will accelerate both their uh, use of blockchain technology and the use of public blockchain technology really to the benefit of, of everyone. I think the big revelation here is, you know, Sandy kind of hit it in the sense of uh, where the diversity is going to come from, because these banks are going to get to a state, just like you mentioned, on stable coins, their own chains, the potential of real world asset tokens, et cetera, that will start to roll out into the market. All of this is going to get flooded into the market in terms of new financial services that will be offered. This is where I think we really start to see the evolution and the real growth of blockchain in general. Now, this is going to have some bleed over into other projects and some other chains out there, including projects like Avalanche and others that have a lot of these tokenization scenarios. What's interesting to me is we haven't seen another chain link just yet. And the technology is there. I'm surprised that we haven't seen another really. Now, there's a lot of road work that has to be done. But in many cases, as all technology does, there's always that first person you know, through the door. Usually they get a little bloody. But then there's usually one or two right after them. So I'm kind of curious as to who and what might be the next movers in this market. Because we're going to remember, we're still very early here. And you only have a handful, a spattering of, of banks and clients that are starting to really go in this direction. Once that the dominoes really start to fall, I think this is going to be a new gold rush. Now, right now, Chainlink, Avalanche, a handful of other projects out there will most likely reap the benefits of this. So it's going to be interesting to watch. We'll definitely get into it. If you look at just over on uh, Coin Market Cap, you can kind of see the real world real world assets uh, right here by Market Cap. Obviously, Chainlink right there at the top of the heap. 3.7 billion in market cap right now. Chainlink has been moving in a lot of the reasons over the last uh, seven days has been of the situation with Citibank. And I think this will only be the beginning. So some others that you could continue to look at, I think in terms of the real world assets, his point of how banks will start to roll these out, going to be very interesting. And the banks, I, I think, will be the ones to watch next. Which banks are really starting to move in this direction? A lot of them already have been in Skunk Works doing the work, and they're now starting to release out a lot more. And the, the key here is you got so many banks that are starting to drop into the market, everybody's going to have to start pushing hard so they don't get left behind because customers will make decisions on, oh, Citibank's doing much more innovative stuff. I should maybe you know work with them, et cetera. All right, so if you guys are part of our Diamond Circle, make sure and, uh, you know, Follow me on Twitter as well. But if you're not part of our Diamond Circle, all you have to do is click the link down below. It's one of the ways we give you additional content. We have a podcast over there. Uh, also, a, a ton of resources that you get access to, into, including a lot of additional analysis that I do that isn't necessarily here on the YouTube channel. And of course, if you want to catch me out there on X, it's just at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechPath.